Good afternoon. I'd like to call the Comox Valley Regional District Board meeting of July 27th, 2021 to order. And today we have a meeting procedure update. So I'll just go through that. With the move to step three in the province of BC's restart plan, the CBRD is opening its meetings to the public once again. A capacity limit of 50 is in place for the civic room. Also, masks are recommended for all meeting attendees, especially where two meter distancing cannot be maintained. As well, live webcasts and recordings of the meetings will continue to be available on the CBRD YouTube channel and on our website. Thank you for your ongoing support as we continue to work through the global pandemic and provide for safe spaces. And I'd like to recognize that we're on the unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation. And today we have Article 37 from the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Indigenous peoples have the right to rec recognition, observance, and enforcement of treaties, agreements, and other constructive arrangements concluded with states on their successors or their successors, and to have states honor and respect such treaties, agreements, and other constructive arrangements. Nothing in this declaration may be interpreted as diminishing or eliminating the rights of Indigenous peoples contained in treaties, agreements, and other constructive arrangements. And with that, we move to C, adoption of minutes from July 13th. Moved up. Second. Grieve and Cole Hamilton, thank you. Any discussion? And anyone opposed to adoption? Hearing and seeing none, that's carried. And we don't have any delegations today, which is unusual, but we don't. So we're moving on to reports and we have the Electoral Areas Service Committee minutes from July 12th. Move. Grant and Hamir, thank you. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried, thank you. And there's a recommendation. Harbor and Grieve, thank you. And it's about uh, the Comox Valley Regional District seeking approval by assent of electors for bylaws 648, 649, and the results of that. Any further discussion? Director Arbor. Yes, thank you. And uh, that rescinds the, the bylaws for the proposed collection services uh, for roadside pickup in the rural areas. And uh, I know there's been lots of discussion about that ESC and, and uh, with the rest of the board around trying to improve uh, recycling outcomes, especially in the rural areas. Um, there's been letters to the record, uh, basically, of, of people um, uh, happy with the outcome, uh, but we're also uh, aware of many people that are unhappy. And, and I think that the important thing here is uh, we will keep working on it because the problem doesn't go away. Um, and I think uh, the rural directors are, are definitely looking forward to keep working on solutions to uh, to improve and, and have more parity in terms of how uh, waste management and recycling is done across the entire Comox Valley. Great. Thank you for that background. And yes, you're correct. It's rescinding first, second and third reading of the three bylaws. Okay. Any further comments? And it's above the full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Carried unanimously. Thank you. On to recommendation two. Second. Arbor and Grieve. And it's about the cultural grant service. Any further discussion? Okay, it's a vote of the areas. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. Recommendation three. Second. Wells and Cole Hamilton. And it's the rural community grants. Any further discussion? And it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried unanimously. And we're on to recommendation four. Arbor and Hamir, thank you. And this is about uh, developing the 
watershed um, management tools for Solom River. Uh, Director Hamir, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, for the directors who are not at ESC and maybe have not had a chance to look at the um, Solom River agricultural water demand, um, the documents that uh, came out of this two-part um, research project here in the Valley, I, I highly recommend it and to, and to the public. Um, some of the things, the, the next three recommendations come out of that report. And um, I know watershed management has come up at this table um, many times. And um, here's a document that we're looking at that's really um, pointing out that that is one of the tools that could very much help the Solom River watershed. So, um, you know, some of the background material, I think, would be really good reading for the rest of the board. Um, and for those of us who are considered or who are very um, considering uh, food security as an issue in, in the community, it's an alarming read. Um, you know, in the next between now and 2050, with uh, climate change, we're looking at a three to 500% increase in water demand. Um, and thinking if summers continue to be like this year, that this, this is going to be the new normal, which is unfortunate. And how do we support local food production when we can no longer count on rainfall and potentially some of the um, glaciers that feed our, our aquifer um, may be decreasing. So it's a bit of depressing reading, I have to say, but incredibly important. So I really want to encourage um, folks to, to read that report. Great, thanks for the background, Director. Any further comments? Okay, and at Savo the Areas, all in favor? It's carried unanimously. On to recommendation five, moved by Arbor and Morin. And as Director Hamir said, this has to do with the um, Watershed Stewardship Service. Any further discussion? Director Arbor. Yeah, thank you. I'll speak on that one as well, um, which stems out of the last one, but we've looking beyond the Solom River, and I know we have the chair of what, the water committee here. We know we're able to uh, help finance some of the watershed conservation efforts through the Comox Valley Water uh, Service, but that only applies to Comox Lake. And one of the things that came out of the Tulum report was, uh, which we've talked a lot at the ASC, is the rest of the lands of the Comox Valley, which uh, huge spans of, of, of lands and forest lands. Um, and we saw Langley Lake last, last month flare out around issues around uh, watershed management. So I think that it's a great recommendation that um, staff investigate of scopes out a study to look at the potential of a, a regional service looking uh, at watershed stewardship. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping the board, um, when it comes, when it comes back to this table, um, will be happy to have a look for now. I, I know it's just a vote of the areas, but uh, hopefully you guys will follow this, uh, this initiative. Thank you. And again, it's the vote of the areas. All in favor? Carried unanimously. We're on to recommendation six. Second. Amir and Greaves, thank you. And this is around reviewing land use planning and policy in regard to watershed protection and the agricultural plan. Any further comment? Again, it's about the areas. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. We're on to recommendation seven. Arbor and Cole Hamilton, thank you. And this is at CVRD Collaborate with the Ministry of Agriculture and Flinro on efforts to assist in existing licensed users and their wells on farms. Any further discussion? Again, it's about the areas. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. We're on to recommendation eight. Grant and Arbor, thank you. And this is regarding staff collaborating with federal and provincial ministers regarding funding options for support for the Solom River Agricultural Watershed Plan, the phase two. Any further discussion? Dr. Morin. 
Uh, just a quick uh, typo there, waster shed. Um, might be a bit of a Freudian <laughs> slip there, but um, just to correct that. Don't want to waste. Don't yes, <laughs> agreed. Thanks, <laughs> staff will make a note of that. Thank you. And Director Amir. Yeah, just to this, um, I, I just want to point out that uh, one of the findings of the study was that um, uh, a great um, way to mitigate what's happening in the Solon River um, watershed is for on-farm storage of water. So where farms can put in dugouts to capture winter rains, mm -hmm. um, they're expensive for farmers. And so, you know, we're asking staff to investigate support, financial support from both levels of, um, of government to support local farms in putting that through. So yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to find support from those levels of government. Yeah, increasing water storage is key. Thank you. Okay, so again, it's a vote of the areas. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. And we're on to recommendation nine. Barber and Cole Hamilton, thank you. And it's that severity perceived with the required public engagement, improved process, and the broadband connectivity of Hornby and Denman. Director Arbor. Thanks. This one is potentially exciting in the sense that uh, we invested some money towards uh, for landing sites for both Hornby and Denman um, with the connected coast fiber optic cable that's going around Vancouver Island. So that's that's proceeding. Uh, but the next stage is we did apply for last mile infrastructure uh, funding to uh, to the province and we're awaiting announcements around that should the announcement be positive. Uh, you know, I think we're looking at, at the potential contribution from uh, the islands. Um, and so that would require some type of electoral assent right now we're thinking a possible referendum this fall if if everything proceeds but uh, we'll, we'll have news later on but I think. I'm hoping the board can support that. It would potentially lead to a, a first um, foray into internet, public internet servicing for the regional district. Uh, Great, thanks for the background. And this is a vote as full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried. And we're on to item two, which is the sewage commission minutes from July 13th. Grant and Morin, thank you. Any discussion on the minutes? And it's the both full board, all in favor? Anyone opposed? It's carried. And we're on to water community minutes from the 13th. Second. Grant and Cole Hamilton, thank you. Any discussion? The both of full board, all in favor? Anyone opposed? Carried unanimously, thank you. We're on to item four. The Recreation Commission from July 13th. Seven. Grant and Warren, thank you. Any further discussion? Let's vote the full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried. And we're on to the public hearing from July 21st. Cole Hamilton and Grant, thank you. And it's about the hearing minutes took place on July 21st. And Director Hamir. Yeah, just wanted to point out that um, if we approve this um, and we start to move forward on this uh, bylaw that we'll finally be moving in line with uh, with Cumberland and Courtney with our, our um, chicken and bee bylaw. So we didn't receive any, um, we received like a, a little bit of negative feedback, but um, the majority we didn't, we said we heard positives or we didn't hear anything. So that was nice to see. Yeah. Great, good to hear, thank you. That's the vote of the full board. All in favor? No one opposed. It's carried unanimously. We're on to item six, which is Comox, Comox Valley Transit Service Improvements. Thank you, Grant and Wells. And pass it over to Steph. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm sitting in for Russell Dyson today, and uh, I'm happy to introduce Michael Zabarski, our manager of transit and facilities, to introduce the staff report, and I think the next staff report also. Michael. Yes, thanks, James. Uh, quick verbal overview of the first one. Uh, we're talking about the transit service improvements that were approved in January this year. As far as the number of hours go, we, we got a board motion to, to uh, provide 3,600 additional service hours. 
since then, we've been working on exactly what to do with those hours. Uh, and that's part of this report here. So firstly, the 3000 hour conventional transit service expansion was initially to be used for the Fifth Street Bridge project. Those are in place now. We're running a modified schedule. It's working quite well, uh, partly due to the, um, I call it the bus lane, but the, the priority lanes that are in place as part of that bridge rehabilitation project, they're working very well and we're hoping we can keep those. So we're gonna work with the city of Courtney staff to see what we, what we can do there. Um, and then the other 600 hours was for a back road service, which we've been working with Comox First Nations on. Uh, we have conducted a survey of their members to see exactly what they want to do. It's looking like two days a week, seven trips per day is their preference. Um, and then back to the 3000 hours, um, the original direction was to primarily use that on the route number one, which is the main transit route in the Comox Valley. It travels through the densest corridors of our community where the most people are and most services. Um, and so what we're gonna do with a good chunk of the hours is to fix some of the on-time performance issues that we've been having with that, um, that bus route. It's being impacted by traffic congestion. And this is talking about before the Fifth Street Bridge project, we were, we were experiencing delays of up to several minutes per trip at certain times of the day. And on-time performance is a real key issue for bus riders. They want their bus to be there at the time that it says in the schedule so that they can rely on it to get to wherever they're going. So some of the hours will be used for that. And then some of them will be used to add three round trips per weekday onto route number one. So just increasing the frequency, making it a little bit more uh, convenient and easy for people to use that, that bus route. Similarly, we'd be using a bunch of the hours to increase the frequency on route number 10 and route number 12. These are the routes that go north and south of, of the core. So all the way down to Fandy Bay on route number 10 and back and all the way up to the Oyster River where we connect with the Campbell River transit system. So we would be using some of the hours to add one round trip per weekday for each of those uh, routes 10 and 12. And that's a quick verbal overview of this report. I'm happy to answer any questions. We have a couple questions, starting with Director Arbor. Thank you. Uh, I found the report really clear and good, and and uh, I, I like the uh, the attempt to uh, service Comox First Nation in, in the back road. I think that's uh, that's a really good initiative, and I think that extra run for number uh, ten and twelve will make a difference to people. There's pretty big gaps right now in, in hours of, of service and, and I think we'll fill those in. I may propose um, if the board will contemplate, I may have a request for a secondary motion. Um, and in October and November, I'll come back with a, a report in terms of, uh, we've had a few presentation and discussion around the work of the Allen Corridor Foundation and what people do appreciate is that there's a, a, a lack of connectivity in public transportation across the entire island. So my secondary motion, if the board is interested, something I presented a couple months back as an idea without a motion, uh, which would be to request staff uh, to have uh, to initiate discussions with the regional district of Nanaimo, the regional district of uh, Strathcona and BC Transit um, around um, connecting the bus systems uh, in the future. Uh, we just saw that uh, the Cowichan Valley Regional District and the Regional District of Nanaimo and BC Transit are launching uh, their interconnected system um, later this year, I believe, or early next year, next year. So anyways, um, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll pass the mic to others if they want to comment, but if people are amenable, I'd like to add that motion. Thank you. Director Wells. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and uh, no, I really appreciate the report. Um, uh, I know I've been confusing people a little bit, so I am wearing my actual hat, uh, uh, although I moved across just to try to uh, confuse people. Yeah, there's no sunglasses, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, but yeah, I just, just wanted to really recognize uh, the, the work that um, uh, Mrs. Abarsi has done and, and I think really the, the work of staff in general. Um, I look at the success of that um, uh, rapid corridor that was uh, introduced many years ago and, and how that's increased that ridership. And I see this as really 
um, kind of an extension of that really like almost like a phase two. Uh, and uh, so really, um, I mean, I, I think the expectations might be might be bigger now than, than maybe they were before, uh, but I think that's a good thing. Um, and so, uh, but I did want to recognize that. Um, now, one of the things that, that you, you had talked about was the um, uh, on time, which is obviously such a, a critical thing. And, and ju just the way it was being discussed uh, or the way you were talking about it, like I, I think maybe I made the assumption uh, that the schedule is kind of auto, not auto, but like every year or so, they kind of, you know, look at traffic and stuff. And I don't know who's in charge of traffic and Courtney, but, you know, um, but if we need to um, have a system that those schedules kind of get reviewed on a more regular basis, and, and, and maybe if you could answer just kind of how, you know, like how bad it is maybe, because uh, maybe it's not as bad, but it just sounded like mm -hmm. like people not getting to where they need to go, so now they can't rely on it is, is a pretty big uh, issue. Yeah, for sure. I wish I knew who is responsible for traffic and Courtney as well. Um, you know, it, it, we're a slow moving beast transit. We, we set our schedules with old information by the time that it's, it's put in place. So the last time that we updated the schedule was in 2018, essentially. Uh, the latest one we just did was purely for the Fifth Street Bridge project. So we don't do it every year. We, we review on-time performance every year, but our opportunities to reset the schedule uh, are kind of limited. And especially when they require additional service hours, that's when we need to get the board to approve an expansion. And that you know doesn't actually happen every year. So it's gotten quite bad. Like I mentioned, we were experiencing delays of up to several minutes per trip at those peak times of the day. So usually people are trying to get to and from school and work and you know they get to where they're going eventually but they may be late and that really turns people off of transit when they when they had to work at 8 30 and we got on there late and maybe they lost their job hopefully not but it definitely becomes not a viable option for people when we're when we're showing up late or they need to take a trip that's earlier and then they feel like they're wasting their time because they got there 20 minutes early so you know, it's pretty important to have a schedule that's reliable and people can kind of trust it and plan their trips accordingly. Um, and some of the things that, you know, we've been talking about with the infrastructure study, like these transit priority lanes and transit priority measures that allow the bus to kind of zip past congestion, those are very, very enticing um, projects because they once you build them, we're done. Like we don't have to keep adding hours every year to catch up with traffic congestion. We're just sailing past it. So we're very keen to work with the municipal staff and, and councils on where we can put those projects in place. Did that answer the question? Well, I, maybe I'm thinking of like a percentage or like, like, you know, just to sort of say like, uh, but I mean, I think you kind of got it at like, it's kind of a peak times thing. This isn't happening all day, every day. It's really those peak times. So unfortunately, probably the most inconvenient times uh, because that's when people uh, might need it more. Yeah. Um, uh, and if I could ask just a subsequent uh, related to that um, is uh, whether or not that impacts transfers. So, so, you know, that bus you're on mm -hmm. is late, but you have to transfer to another bus. So if your bus is late, does that other bus have to wait for you or does it, it does doesn't start wait. Mess, That's right? a good point. It's not just getting to work and, and being late. It's, it's making those connections. And so people that are traveling, let's say from Cumberland into Courtney and trying to connect with route number one, if, you know, if it's late, they're not going to make the connection. The other bus is not waiting for them. So yeah, you start to really see where that compounds. It, it makes it very unattractive to yeah. a transit rider when they're missing connections late for work or school, wow. uh, or they're just sitting there not sure if their bus is coming, like standing at a bus stop and looking at the schedule and your watch and thinking, did I miss something? Am I in the right place? Mm -hmm. That's, that doesn't instill confidence in people. And, and, uh, and is there an app that kind of does the GPS -y stuff? Yeah, there is an app and it does show in real time where the bus is. So some people are pretty tech savvy and they'll, if they're wondering about things, they can look on their app and see, oh yeah, the bus is still coming. It's just looking like it's late. It doesn't help them get to work on time, but at least it <laughs> reassures them that we're coming to pick them up. 
Awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I guess my biggest concern really is that connection thing compounds that issue, I, I think, uh, mm. uh, in, in a way that uh, really is critical. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Director Moran. Great. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for the report. I was wondering, I have a couple questions. We'll see if I, I'm able to squeeze them both in. Um, I'm wondering about what the numbers are um, with ridership um, on that fifth with the fifth street bridge construction if you've seen an increase in ridership um and i know we've already had impacts due to covid so i don't know how you could really say you know is it back to covid pre-covid levels or just wondering if you're seeing that bus being that route being utilized more yeah it's definitely a tough to compare the ridership numbers that we have now with anything else um we are seeing that they are recovering from covid and and generally slowly trending back upwards um but we're still way down you know around right. half of what we used to be and it is really hard to say you know with the fishery bridge how how much uh, use those buses are getting because of the traffic congestion that's happening on the bridge right um, yeah, you but can't really I, tell whether they were existing riders coming back or yeah unfortunately we can't out. we can't do that and i wish we had a normal year this year to compare it to a normal year before right. but unfortunately yeah with the pandemic it's made uh, all of our ridership stats really wonky right and then i guess sort of related to that is i know we've done surveys in the like ridership um, surveys in the past and i just wondered if there was um there was one in the works um, around ridership habits to see it, you know, to maybe try to to uh, mine some information around whether any ridership habits have changed post COVID. Well, we're sort of still in COVID, but um, yeah, with the Transit Future Plan, we we were going to do a survey uh, of riders, but um, another piece of exciting data that we're going to get into pretty soon is through the transportation alternatives assessment. So this was a piece of work the board approved in the budget to look at other modes of transportation and, and kind of be able to compare them to transit and how they achieve the goals of the board. So through that work, we're actually, we're, we're using what's called big data. So instead of a telephone survey, there's a, there's a, a number of providers of this information, but it uses people's cell phones that are tracking location and it can mine all of their travel habits. <laughs> you might not want to it sounds that. scary and I'm going <laughs> to basically turn my phone off as soon as I get this data, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, it'll allow us to know through the Comox Valley where people are going, what time they're going, how long their trips are, are they going by car, are they going by bike? Um, and it'll just be really, really good data for us to, to, to plan transit schedules and transit routes, but also any other aspect of transportation planning that, that we may want to get into. So I think we'll have a lot better sense of where people are going and what time and how people are moving around the community after we get this data. Right. Yeah, because I was actually had another note about a, an actual app for the survey, but of course that would be a voluntary thing. Um, yeah, <laughs> just imagining people, you know, who are calling in sick and are actually on the bus to Hornby today, or um, somebody who went out for a jug of milk and is down at uh, Fluid or something. Anyway, <laughs> don't want to cause too many. Uh, we, we won't be tracking that. <laughs> Thanks. And it would be aggregate data, right? It's not. Oh yeah, it's a hundred percent like never know. all privacy is, is accounted for for sure. It's a small town. We're watching you though. Um, and, and since you brought it up, just wondering about the timeline for transit future plan. Um, we're still working with BC Transit to kind of pick the timing, but it's either fall or, or early winter that we would relaunch that. And at this point, they're suggesting we probably would just go back to square one. So we had done all the stakeholder consultation previously, and it's been you know so long now that we wanted to do a recheck in with them on that. Um, and and they're looking at it about a six month kind of process to relaunch and then have it completed and and approved by the board. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Cole Hamilton, you didn't. I was just gonna check that it would confirm that it 
was anonymous data. Oh, yes, okay. Made that point, so <laughs> anonymous data, data, yes. Yeah, <laughs> okay, thanks for, for your report, Mike. And we are on receipt. And it's the vote of the full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? It's carried unanimously. And as a recommendation, yes. Uh, Wells and Cole Hamilton, thank you. And that's regarding the addition of the 3,600 hours and the back road service. Any further discussion? So vote the full board, all in favor? Anyone opposed? It's carried unanimously. And Director Arbor, you had a secondary motion? Oh, go ahead. Thank you. If it's, if it's seconded, that'd be great. Um, I'm going to try to be as succinct as I can for Visa. Um, that uh, staff be directed to initiate discussions with the regional district of Nanaimo, the Strathcona regional district, and BC Transit to explore connecting the three bus systems. Cole Hamilton, second. Any further discussion? Director. Oh, okay. Uh, go ahead. Oh, now I put your mic on. Though. Okay, Director Grief, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I think that our uh, representative at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities is totally up to speed on this. I think the federal government has realized that uh, that, that transit is not strictly an urban uh, issue anymore, that with the dissolution of uh, bus service from Greyhound in Western Canada, there's huge gaps now uh, in, in, uh, in the ability of people to take any kind of transportation between communities. And uh, I would, I'm pretty sure that there is some uh, funding opportunities out there as well through the feds to do this kind of thing. Um, I, I really appreciate Director Arbor bringing this forward. Um, I brought this forward in 2012 and uh, it was uh, kind of laughed off the table at the time as being ridiculous, but of course now it's not. Um, I remember the former uh, minister uh, boasting at the UBCM that uh, she was able to uh, take the bus from Agassiz to Horseshoe Bay on a transfer. Well, that's the lower mainland, of course, we know they, they get uh, more than their share of tax dollars. <laughs> so, I mean, this is a small thing, but it is uh, it is obviously needed. It's not as though um, you're competing with the private sector, although there is some uh, bus services out there. Anybody that wants to take the slow boat all the way to Horseshoe Bay, uh, slow boat, slow bus, uh, with all the stops is obviously somebody that, that has doesn't have the means to, uh, to uh, pay, the, pay the price for a faster transport. But it's, it's an idea I think whose time has come and I certainly would be supporting it. I do think that there is probably some funding opportunities out there as well. So I, um, I do thank the director from Area A for bringing this forward. Thank you. Thanks, Director Reed. Back to you, Director Arbor. Yeah, thanks for further background. So with um, Cowichan Regional District and Nanaimo closing the gap and Cowichan and Victoria already be li been linked and us and Strathcona being linked, there is now an eight kilometer gap between Campbell, Campbell River and Victoria. So I try to imagine a future where for two or four dollars or whatever the final prices be, somebody can travel from Campbell River down to take the ferry to Vancouver or to go down to Victoria and vice versa. Uh, I think that's pretty fantastic. And in terms of political support, I was encouraged by our MLA and Minister of Municipal Affairs to bring this forward. I think there's appetite at the province to uh, see a proposal like that. So I'm hoping we'll be in favor of staff exploring this. Thank you, Director Moore. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I, I, I uh, think uh, Director Grief kind of alluded to the social equity piece, um, which I think is really important. Um, we, we know that many people have barriers um, having a vehicle and, and having economical ways to get around. And I think that it's one way that we can hopefully improve that for people. Um, although we don't hear about a lot of safety issues on our highway, we know in other areas of the province, it's a huge issue. And, and I would suspect that 
that there are safety issues that are happening that maybe we don't hear about because people don't have safe, reliable transportation. Um, and of course, we've heard from um, about the the uh, the benefits for um, uh, climate change and and integrating that social equity piece um, as well. So I think there's lots of benefits, and um, I thank Director Arbor for bringing it forward. Thank you. Thank you, and we have the motion up on screen. It's the vote of the full board. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. We're on to item seven, which is the transit service rural bus stops budget amendment. Cole Hamilton Wells, thank you. And I'll pass it to Steph. Yes, thank you. Speaking of connecting uh, our regions, we're going to need more bus stops on the highways. Um, so I brought a report to the board in January that had a very similar tone to it. Uh, in the rural areas, we use the MOTI minor transit minor betterment funding to construct bus stops. Uh, this has been something that has been happening for several years. Um, this year basically is the first year that CBRD are essentially leading these projects. It used to be MOTI staff that would actually do the construction, um, but they're um, asking us to do that. So essentially what we're doing is a budget amendment to receive $200,000 from MOTI. And then we have an expenditure where we're gonna go hire a contractor to spend $200,000 on uh, bus stop infrastructure. Uh, with these funds, we would be getting nine bus stops and bus stops in the, on the highways all require a paved pull off. And we'll also be putting in a, a concrete pad for future bus shelters. And so the nine are going, uh, six of them on back road to address the, um, the new bus service that we're gonna be putting in place there. One on Torrance Road and two on uh, Clarkson Avenue up Saratoga Beach. So these are all MOTI uh, jurisdiction roads. So this is really just a simple budget amendment to receive the $200,000 and show the expenditure. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Director Wells. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just had a question uh, um, that sort of sounds like it's down the road, but you mentioned that the pads are gonna be put in for uh, shelters at some point in the future. And I know like within the city sometimes, and I think maybe the town, the same thing where like sometimes nonprofits and other organizations come to the table. Is, is that similar or is the regional district kind of on its own to, to deal with the shelters themselves? Yeah, that's correct. Um, all the shelters in the rural areas have all been put in by the regional district. Uh, we've been applying for funding for those and we typically prioritize the, the locations that we feel might have the, the biggest opportunity for ridership. Uh, so we'll kind of see how these ones play out and that's why we're putting that pad down at this time, at this time to allow us to easily put in a shelter down the road. Excellent, thanks. Director Arbor. There are always exceptions. I, I did notice a, a new shelter on Hornby where I think we contracted out with High Seek for them to put some infrastructure uh, and it's very pretty. I think they, they finished it uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, while you had the mic, um, our transit manager was quoted in the paper talking about the fire sales on the, on the infrastructure dollars uh, <laughs> to assist with transit improvements. And, and I know that uh, you've been going around the municipalities talking about that. Will we expect a, a more fulsome report around some of those infrastructure improvements in the future or what would be the time? Yeah, so I was at the councils, um, all three of them in the last couple of months with BC Transit and Urban Systems uh, assisted with the, down, with the Courtney presentation. And we were basically uh, providing an overview of the transit infrastructure study that we brought to the board earlier this year. Uh, we've gotten some feedback from the councils and I'll make a couple of tweaks uh, and then bring that report back to the board, hopefully September, October-ish, and highlight the changes that we're recommending and and we can speak more to the kind of fire sale funding. So it's, it's an 80% senior government funding opportunity right now. So it, it's a really good opportunity to, to build some of this infrastructure and it's, it's typically the larger infrastructure. So not so much bus, individual bus shelters, more like full transit exchanges, uh, transit priority measures, those kinds of things. 
And the other piece of work that we're doing this year that we'll be bringing back to the board is uh, a study of the transit maintenance facility. We don't own uh, that facility, it's, uh, it's owned by the operator, which pre presents some challenges, one of which is the board's interest in electric buses. So there's probably no way we're gonna build a charging system on private property that we don't own. Um, so we wanna get that study done and the 80% funding would also be something that could be applied to, to that project as well. So we'll be br bringing a couple of reports back to the board um, later this year. Great, thanks. Director Moore. Um, when you're talking about shelters, I was thinking about benches as well. And are the benches allocated in the same way? And the reason I bring it up is I've been in area A quite a bit lately. I noticed there's quite a few stops um, that folks have put chairs out. And so it made me think that those are stops where people, you know, need to, you know, need to sit down. Um, and I just wondered how, how that was sorted out. Yeah, those are, those are definitely nice lawn chairs people are using at some of those bus stops. Uh, those are typically stops that don't have a lot of ridership. Um, you know, we track our ridership pretty well in Comox Valley. All, all the buses have, have the equipment on board to track exactly where people are getting on and off. So, yeah, those are ones that are, I'm and not sure not why people are. not necessarily places that really have traffic. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. That. Just remember that, advocating for Area A. <laughs> okay, let's see any further questions or on receipt. So both the full board, all in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried unanimously. And there's a recommendation. Arbor and Cole Hamilton, thank you. And that's uh, increasing the capital expenditures for the infrastructure projects. Any further discussion? And so both the full board, all in favor? Anyone opposed? Carried unanimously, thank you. Moving on to item eight. Move report. Thank you. That's Grieve and Hamir moving the Merville Fire Hall construction notice of award. And does staff want to speak to this? Thanks, Madam Chair. But staff doesn't have a presentation per se, but certainly available for any questions. Um, I think this is an exciting milestone in this project, and, and we're pleased to see that the contract can be awarded, has been awarded, and, uh, and we'll be sure to keep the board updated on the project as it evolves. But as I say, staff are available for any questions you may have. Great, thank you. Director Grieve. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to take this opportunity to uh, commend staff on uh, persevering on this fire hall. It is uh, certainly uh, going to be appreciated by the residents uh, of the northern uh, counties with the Area B and Area C south of the Oyster River. Um, we have a, a kind of an area there where it's, uh, you know, it's not really serviced. We ha uh, have a contract uh, usually with the Courtney Fire Department in the northern part of the Oyster River, but um, we've uh, been a long time uh, coming on this. Um, I think I mentioned once before in a meeting that uh, I was talking to uh, Courtney's former fire chief, Lawrence Burns, telling him that we're building a fire hall in Merville. And he laughed saying, oh yeah, we were gonna do that in the sixties. So it takes a while for government to actually work. But in this case, it's coming to fruition finally. Um, and it's, it's certainly needed because um, not only uh, are we getting um, uh, a response to uh, fire calls, but we also have the ability for first responders to get to your house in a timely fashion with a defibrillator or what you needed um, in that area. It's also um, allows people to age in place in the rural areas. You know, it's, it's a big one. And uh, certainly um, it's cost a little more than, than we initially uh, uh, expected, but you know, with the price of building materials right now, I think a sheet of three quarter inch plywood is a hundred bucks. So, you know, it's, it's understandable, but uh, certainly this, this is a, a big boost uh, for the residents of, uh, of uh, Northern Area B and Area C. And I'd like to thank staff for, for bringing it to fruition. 
Thank you. I look forward to seeing everybody at the ribbon cutting ceremony. Great. Thanks for your comments, Director Brief. And it's a vote of area B and C. So all in favor? <laughs> it's carried unanimously. <laughs> We're on to item nine, the Union Bay Water Service Budget Amendment. Harbor and Wells, thank you. Thank you, and I'm happy to introduce Mariah Fort, uh, our Chief Financial Officer, to introduce the staff report. Great, thank you very much, James. Um, through the chair to uh, the board and Director Arbor. So this is following our last meeting uh, to the Electoral Area Services Committee where we did a financial overview for the UBID service conversion. So we've been spending time working with the UBID staff team and our existing team transitioning the fire, water, and street lighting services. Um, and through that, we identified there's some key projects that we want to move ahead on through that service transition. That includes um, constructing the water portable uh, to provide essentially a, an office for the staff and a washroom facility that wasn't contemplated within the water treatment plant build, as well as the fiber connection. So um, we're wanting to enhance and integrate the two water systems together, and that's really looking at the SCADA and water management system and also the operational teams within CBRD and UBID. Um, and it does take quite a bit of time with the internet provider, six, up to six months on the fiber particularly. So we're wanting to really move ahead on these amendments um, today. Um, I did want to make a note is that uh, Director Arbor had sort of requested us to look at using Community Works funds uh, for funding for these projects. And we do have a, pro a report coming on the next EA meeting, um, taking a look at the status of those funds. Um, but we did want to move ahead of these projects for now. So we've allocated them capital works, but they can be reallocated and directed later if Director Arbor so wished. Um, but we did want to move ahead as noted because of the timeline pressures on these ones. Thanks, Mariah. Director Arbor. Yeah, thanks to staff. And, and we had a meeting uh, between the ESC and this meeting with the uh, conversion group, which is composed of past trustees of, of the Union Bay Improvement Districts and some really good observations uh, as we launch into financial planning. And uh, and and obviously these, these projects need to be done. But beyond that, I think we'll be receiving a water master plan uh, in five or six months from now, which will kind of delineate um, future uh, financial requirements, especially for the water, well, for the water service. Um, but also another study, which will look at broader needs um, around a new fire hall and all these things. So in the short term, let's get those two projects done and let's pay attention to every line item as, as, uh, as has been done in the past. And um, once we get some more reports, uh, we'll be able to, to carry on uh, towards the 2022 financial plan. Okay, I'm not seeing any further questions. We're on receipt. Suppose a full board, all in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried unanimously. And there's a recommendation. Arbor and grief. <laughs> and this is uh, to approve the uh, budget amendment. Any further discussion? And it's a vote of the full board again, all in favor? Anyone opposed? Carried unanimously, thank you. We're on to bylaws and resolutions for first, second, third reading and adoption. So the first bylaw is 674, the Royston Water Conservation Bylaw. Second. Grieve and grant, thank you. And both full board, all in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried. Well, Hamilton and Grieve in unison. <laughs> and for the full board, all in favor? Anyone opposed? Carried unanimously. On to. On to <laughs> Cole Hamilton and Grant. <laughs> for adoption, all in favor? Anyone opposed? It's carried. Okay, on to bylaws for third reading, bylaw 602, the Rural Comox Valley Zoning Bylaw. Arzina, or Director Javier and Grant. And it's a vote of the areas. All in favor? 
that's carried unanimously. And that brings us to new business. And it's uh, regarding the um, appointments and the Comox Valley Airport Commission bylaw. Wells and Grant, thank you. And uh, just an update on this. So um, as everyone knows, um, we will have some changes with our economic uh, development service. And uh, part of CVAC's bylaw is that um, the CVEDS is a nominating um, committee. So uh, we just wanted to update them on the changes that will be um, reflected on their bylaw. But we did receive an email, staff did receive an email from them that they are aware and um, they have we are going to implement some changes and they want to uh, give us the update on those changes uh, next month. Yeah, so they'll be coming to the board next month. So um, the, there isn't really a need to um, to send them any letters today, but we can still discuss it, Director Hamir. Thanks, yeah, and you know, this was the reason that it was brought to the board's attention, just um, that procedural issue around um, the nomination and, and how it was occurring. Um, but, you know, it, I just wanted to point out that our policy for um, nominating to CVAC is, you know, circa 2014. And if, um, I don't know if there's any appetite to make any kind of um, amendments or changes now, I think would be a good time. Um, we've already got an appointee on, on, this, on the board, but um, it's, a, it's an organization I kind of see kind of like CVEDS where we've not, we've been very hands arm's length at two. And I don't know if um, if folks are interested in, in any kind of change in in that way. So just wanted to, to bring that up and see if, if there was any appetite. Yeah, again, I think that's probably a good discussion to have um, after they present to us and uh, tell us about the changes that they'll be making within their own bylaw. Any further discussion? Not seeing any. So we're on receipt, all in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried unanimously. And that brings us to the end of the meeting. Cole Hamilton and Wells. <laughs> <laughs> all in favor? <laughs> Anyone opposed? <laughs>